Skylane November 60381 en route from Jackson, Mississippi to Shreveport, Louisiana. The flight plan was a direct, a roughly 185 nautical miles, and the time en route would be approximately an hour and a half. The pilot filed for 6,000 feet, and as you're about to hear in the audio, uh, somewhere outside of Ravel, Louisiana, reported some icing and requested lower to 4,000 feet, and again uh, contacted uh, Monroe Approach and requested from 4,000 feet to 2,000 feet. Now, though both of those reports would raise red flags. Um, at some point, one would have to decide it would it be prudent to divert to Ravel, which was roughly about four miles away along his route. This route pretty much took him along the I-20 corridor all the way from Jackson, Mississippi to Shreveport. And then when he requested from 4,000 to 2,000, he was within about six miles of the Monroe Airport. At that point, I would think any time you're requesting 4,000 down to 2,000 feet, that would be an automatic declaring an emergency to me. Exactly. But if when you listen to the tape, you're going to see that he pretty much downplays the amount of icing he's getting. Yeah. It, yeah. He reports his light rhyme and doesn't seem to be overly alarmed or concerned about it. So if he was picking up icing that was worse than reported, that may be noble to, right. to kind of make his passengers feel a little safe and at ease. But on the other hand, that may not have triggered ATC to maybe react the way they should react if you're reporting icing that's, that's less than what it is. So either way, I'm going to go with the assumption that he reported the icing as factual and what he was experiencing because right. that prudence would dictate being forthright with ATC so they can react right. ac accordingly. You know, this pilot too is a commercial pilot. He is accustomed to speaking with ATC. He, you know, is aware of, you know, making sure he's informing them of actual situations. So you would think that he wouldn't necessarily be, you know, downplaying what is happening. And, and I agree with that. It was just a possible scenario right. Right. Uh, for, for us to consider. Yeah, this accident occurred near to where I grew up, where, where Ron was raised. And we fly in this area real often going down to visit my dad. And so we did get some phone calls um, wanting to know, making sure that we were okay. Um, it was a 182 right in our backyard where we fly. So mm. we fly in and out of Ruston real often. And out of Monroe occasionally as yeah. well. So um, anyway, it, there were a few phone calls making sure that we were okay. Yeah, and uh, making sure it wasn't us. Right. Um, the accident site itself we're extremely familiar with. We've driven by it multiple times. Right. Uh, in the neighborhood we lived in in Monroe, we would go and pick up sod in right. Chatham, Louisiana right. quite often. Right. So um, it, it kind of, it, it makes this accident very much close to home. It was in a, it was in an airplane, very similar to what, what we fly, what yeah. we fly. And it was in an area that we know. We are also familiar with some of the Monroe ATC personnel. We um, have gone and toured the Monroe Tower. And so it just really made this feel very um, close to heart yeah. for us. This is, uh, was it flight into known icing? There were some pie reps that some other pilots right. were picking up some icing. Did he have that prior to taking off? Or were we starting to get that after he uh, took off from Jackson, Mississippi? Now, you will hear in the video that another pilot uh, reported in and noted that he broke out at 6,500 feet. Right. So sometimes descending is not your the best, best option. option. Sometimes, I mean, he was at 6,000 feet. He'd only have to go another five, six hundred feet, and he would have broke out, and sublimation would have took effect and would have taken care 
of the icing. With that said, these were the conditions at the time of flight. They were reporting ceilings overcast at about 1,100 feet, and we were getting temperatures in the uh, minus 1 to plus 2 centigrade range, and you'll even hear in the audio that the pilot reports what his current temperature conditions right. are as well. So prime icing conditions, right. right in the middle of that envelope, uh, because he is an IMC. Uh, you, you'll see in the track logs that he gets below 100 knots uh, when he's finally cleared. Now he, he decides to divert to Ruston and, and get on the RNAV 36 approach. He is only, he is just almost to the initial approach fix right. for the RNAV. And that's where he, he descends rapidly. We would have to assume uh, some sort of a stall spin and obviously not enough altitude to recover. However, was there enough icing to cause that? Now remember, icing does raise your stall speed mm -hmm. and he's getting below 100 knots and that's getting kind of slow. In a 182, we don't typically change any configuration until the final approach fix or one dot on the glide slope above the final approach fix is where we put in flaps and slow and, and start right. our descent. However, as you know, in icing conditions, it's best not to change any of your configuration. You don't want to disrupt the airflow over the controlling surfaces and you want to take off the autopilot so that you can get that linear feedback as what's going on. But with light rhyme, was that enough to slow him down to the point that he could have stalled? I want you to look very carefully at the photographs. I want to throw in another possible scenario. Typically, when an aircraft impacts the ground, uh, you'll see that the propeller blades are curled over or destroyed with the exception of, you know, when you do a wheels up landing and you turn off the gas and you shut down the engines and feather the props and, you know, the, on a three-bladed prop, the two that typically are pointed down get curled over because the engine's no longer running. You're going to see this is a three-bladed propeller and two of the blades look almost... Perfectly straight. <laughs> perfectly straight. They, they look almost undamaged. It would suggest to me, possibly, that the air filter iced over and choked the engine, and that's where the, the decrease in speed came from. I, I believe that he had an engine out mm -hmm. and could not maintain the speed, and in IMC conditions, uh, just couldn't have a focal point to descend and get some of his speed up and look for a place to land until he broke out, which at, you know, 1,100 feet, you know, you only had, you know, I, I believe the ground elevation around there is around 300 feet or so. So you so didn't you, have long. You, you didn't have but five, six, seven, eight hundred feet possibly to, right. to do something. Uh, but at that point, you're going slow enough with icing that you're probably already into a stall spin scenario. So this one's a tough one. It's hard to draw a definitive conclusion because you know, we can't see if, if the flaps were down, the, you know, the plane aircraft was destroyed by fire after impact. Right. And possibly, uh, you know, over the next year, NTSB might be able to shed a little more light to mm -hmm. this. Um, February 6th of 2020, it's a relatively recent incident. So, yeah, in NTSB world, yes. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. And so there could be some findings that come about you know, through the as, investigation, as they continue the investigation, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, right now, it's it's a little bit of speculation, uh, although I, I, I'm tending to believe, based on the conditions of the propeller blade, and, and I may be reading too much into right. it, right. that there there is a high uh, degree of probability that we had an engine out, still due to the icing. Um, so we'll, we'll see how this plays out. 
What are your thoughts? See what your thoughts are. Comment below. Um, obviously, I'm sure a lot of you will say, well, I would have never taken off to begin with. But you know, just put yourself into the position that he was in. He's already taken off. Now, right. what are our steps? Right. You know, I, I, I've had a little bit of icing before during instrument training. It makes you quite uneasy. And I know that had I not taken off, if I just made the decision not to, but let's say I did, that I had two perfectly good airports to land at. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're having to descend as low as he is having to descend, right. that, that, that just discounts a lot of options that you could ha possibly have when you're descended to that altitude. Yeah, yeah, that's just incredibly low. Right. Uh, that, that, There's even, no time to do anything. Even in altitude. VFR conditions, that's right. that's getting kind of low. I mean, right. you, you're almost a pattern altitude at that altitude. Right. So, uh, now that's fine, perfectly clear skies. You can see what you have and you have options, but not an IMC and not an icing. Right. So, uh, those are some big red flags of why the pilot chose to continue this flight beyond Ravel and surely beyond Monroe, which he was already talking to approach control in Monroe. Right. So, I mean, that's where you had the option. Janice had mentioned that we know some of the controllers at Monroe, and a lot of times these accident investigations, we, we tend to be remiss into pointing out the role they play. They they do a, an incredible job, mm -hmm. many times a thankless job. And we just want to say, maybe because we kind of know some of them, we just want to say, you know, good job. You handled this very professionally. Right. Uh, it, was, it was handled with as much grace that you could. Pilot filed a flight plan from Jackson, Mississippi to Shreveport, Louisiana, approximately 183 nautical miles away. At 107, Skylane November 60381 departed Jackson, Mississippi at the Jackson Hawkins Field Airport en route to Shreveport, Louisiana. The pilot continued his climb out to his assigned altitude of 6,000 feet. Skyline 60381, we have 6,000. Skyline 60381, Monroe approach, altimeter 29065. 29065, thank you. Monroe 60381. Skyline 60381, Monroe approach. Yes, sir, pick it up a little light at 6,000. I'm going to put 4,000 on request, please. Skyline 381, just to maintain 4,000. Send to maintain 4,000 for 60381. Now, let's look at this again. He's picking up icing at 6,000 feet and requests lower to 4,000 feet. But if you look at the ADSB telemetry, we're starting to see some very abrupt changes in the course direction of the aircraft. So we don't know if icing can affect this. I'd like to think not. All I know is, is he's picking up icing and the Ravel Airport is only four miles away, and prudence would dictate that that would be the first place I would want to stop at. So let's pick up where we left off and see the rest of his flight path. So as you see, he's descending from 6,000 down to 4,000 feet. Skyline 381, uh, do you know the outside air temperature and the uh, type of ice? Well, it's uh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, and what I'm seeing looks like just a little bit of rime um, on the strut and on the edge of the windshield. Not a whole lot, but we're going to be safe. Skyline 381, Roger. Monroe 60381, we're going to hang out here at 4,000 shortly. Looks like it warmed up slightly. We've shed some ice. Um, how would you guys feel about us going to 2,000 if we needed to? Okay, let's pause here for just a minute. We are at 6,000 feet requested 4,000 due to some icing and passed a perfectly good airport to land at to wait out for the icing. And now you've requested to descend from 4,000 feet to 2,000 feet and now you have another perfectly good airport only six miles to your north. Sign uh, 60381, uh, about the lowest I can get you over to Shreveport is uh, 3,000 um, because once you're uh, Outside about 40 miles from Monroe, the MBA increases to about 3,000 over there. 
Right now we're fine. I'll, I'll just keep an eye on it and let you know. We may go to 3,000 then. Thanks. Skyline 3 at 1, Roger. 603 at 1. Let's go ahead and do 3,000 if we can, please. Skyline 603 at 1, Roger. Uh, stand by. Let me coordinate with tower. Thank you. Skyline 3 at 1. This is to maintain 3,000. This is to maintain 3,000 for 603 at 1. Thanks. Skyline 603 at 1 is westbound at 3,000. He was at 6, but he was getting some icing. Uh, here's the IRF about that. Air in 7 Echo Tango, contact Memphis Center 135.87. 135.87 for Echo Tango. We just now broke out on top 6,000. Hey, Metro 6031, we're going to stop in Ruston, get some ice off the airplane. If you could uh, give us a vector uh, for the RNAV, please. Number 381 advice when you have the rest and weather, which RNAV approach, and you didn't want the uh, RNAV via fix. Uh, one moment. Okay, 6031, we'd like the RNAV for runway 36 into Ruston, please. We have the weather noted. Cessna 381, Roger, clear direct to Rukow, left turn direct to Rukow, cross Rukow, out of 2000, cleared RNAV runway 36 approach to the Ruston airport. Okay, it's direct Rukow and uh, cleared RNAV approach into Ruston for uh, 36. The pilot begins his turn to the initial approach fix and also descending from 3,000 to his assigned altitude of 2,000 feet for the approach. You'll notice that he goes below 2,000 feet and also has a decrease in ground speed as well. This is uh, 381, uh, low altitude alert, altitude gets 1,000. If as you climb immediately, uh, the altitude you should be at is 2,000. Sky on 6031, one approach. Sky on 6031, one approach. November 1061, Foxtrot. Can you try to raise 60381 on frequency? Okay, call that again. 60381. 60381. 61 Fox Trot, you copy? 3161 Fox Trot, you copy? Negative approach. Roger. This incident would fall under AQP number 15, uncontrolled flight into terrain due to icing. Souls lost on November 60381 was pilot Bob William Robert Gillum. Passenger Christopher Quentin Mudd and passenger Wade Williams. Our deepest condolences go out to the surviving members of the family as they mourn the absence of their presence in their lives.